working, that the children working with materials of this sort, their curiosity is exercised. They are looking for the answers to things, and when they find it, that's their reward. They don't need gold stars or approbation. They should get these in, in some sort of a long run thing. They also sense as they move along an increase in their own competence. And this is pretty heady. That this is what keeps one moving. This is this is one of the basic ways in which you, you have to fight what I want to call the, the sort of middle dropout, the kid who drops out out of sheer boredom because he's never had a, a decent intellectual experience in the classroom. And they're getting an intellectual experience. We're in the laboratory in a double sense. The, we're trying to import the laboratory into the classroom, and we ourselves are regarding the classroom as a laboratory. I would say the pendulum is one of the classic uh, examples of a system which uh, uh, requires a knowledge of all the laws of physics before you understand it adequately. We're just beginning to probe uh, with this particular piece of equipment. Uh, the study of the properties of the pendulum is very close to the beginnings of the fundamental ideas of modern physics. And one sees here, first of all, a certain style of work, a certain attack on the part of a child, which we think is very important, that he be at this stage quite free to design his own way or to develop his own way of going into the subject. The pendulum itself has remarkable properties which go on the trees uh, to the, as one child said, the tail of a dog. I think that, that the important thing to bear in mind here is not only that they're learning some physics, and I'm not going to go into that, but that the kind of learning that they're doing now is of a kind that they can use, that uh, they're getting it in a way that'll stick to their bones, if you will. They're taking observations, they're introducing to the observations some way of regularizing them, groping for their own way of stating the lawfulness of phenomena that they observe. We're trying to give them some sense of physics such that they can become their own physicists rather than, than being mere spectators. And this is what the nature of the learning is that's taking place. The great simplifications tend to be quite abstract. Getting some sense of the simplicities of nature, some of these grand simplicities, is precisely something that takes a while. And indeed, if anything is worth taking a while at, it is this, you cannot give them the sense of the simplicity of phenomena simply by saying how it goes. You've got to let them go through these exercises. Oppenheimer is fond of saying, there are children here in the street who can solve some of my toughest physics problems because they have modes of perception which I have lost. The playground approach to physics or any other learning a process is a really a from the old curriculum of classified subjects and fragmented data, well processed, neatly packaged, a changeover into the world of discovery and of participation in the act of discovery, which is a producer orientation rather than a consumer orientation. I think this big watershed is occurring as a result of speed up of data. The great thing about making a film loop in a cartridge is that you, you make it available even to, to the, the clumsiest people to put right into a machine and run off and look at again and again and again. My feeling after showing a similar class, uh, some loops about the pendulum, and uh, feeling their reaction to seeing this film after they had been working for several weeks in the classroom with very similar equipment, my, my feeling was uh, this was a very dramatic experience for the, for the kids to see uh, from the adult world, a slightly more elegant presentation of the very material that they had been working with themselves. And they saw everything in these films. Whereas if you showed these films to children who'd never played with the pendulum, never done these kinds of experiments and so on, I think they would get almost no, almost no information and, all, and very little of pedagogical value from them. So I think the film has to be linked closely with the work. But the great thing about the technology is that it can produce, or provide, let me say, it can provide experience which the child cannot have with the naked eye. The eight millimeter loop film to me, which seems to be termed a concept film, the, uh, the beauty of it to me, the fact that it is a single concept, 
and it's within the range of each individual child and uh, provides the opportunity for the child to go through it several times and that it's uncluttered uh, with the um, audio without any other influences so that the child can concentrate entirely on what he's seeing and uh, it's training him in observation, I feel. One of the children mentioned to me that this allows them to be individualists. This way they can observe without word or sound and they can interpret it for themselves in several ways. And this is something else that I particularly appreciate about the concept films. They do lend themselves to a variety of interpretations. But I think they should be very available, that is, within each room, so that they can take them as they need them. The very technologies we've been seeing in the classrooms speed up data to a speed where the ind independent and unrelated facts uh, are unimportant compared to the patterns between facts. So we move from a world of uh, mechanically classified and processed data into a world of pattern recognition and discovery. The children learn in the same general way, I think, that they learn to speak their own native language. That is, they learn inductively as opposed to being taught. It's a peculiar situation that we are uh, encountering a more inclusive kinds of technologies which involve more of the human being in the learning process, and we're confronted with a great many people of exclusive and departmentalized and specialist skills and attitudes toward learning who are not very friendly toward integral forms of learning. Any, any, any specialist is going to uh, see to it that his specialty is protected against any invasion from any quarter. And uh, so a fragmented people are uh, great experts in sensing uh, threats from more integrated sort of forms of learning. <laughs> They've got a very good thing. They've taken a long time to acquire this specialist skill, and they don't see why they should uh, yield one inch to uh, people with different methods. Oh. Okay, Moore's approach it brings the whole method of teaching uh, phonetic literacy or teaching literacy closer to the actual mo norms of learning speech itself, the spoken word, by involvement of the whole sensorium of uh, sight and sound and movement and uh, the whole involvement of the whole being. So uh, it's not surprising that uh, people uh, would uh, accept this as a, a more congenial uh, form of learning and certainly one much closer to the nature of language itself than that of the older forms of literacy. I think in addition to whatever they learn in the sense of uh, academic skills, that they uh, are acquiring a sense of independence, they can take problems without waiting for somebody to provide a solution. Haiku. What does haiku mean, Tammy? Haiku is Japanese poetry. Ivy on a wall, like we little animals, climbing to their homes. Uh, this kind of method would enable people of so-called slow and retarded characteristics to perform quite well. Uh, it also enables people of ordinary uh, characteristics to perform very much better. So it raises the uh, general, uh, accelerates the general rate of intake and of learning and uh, perception and grasp for all, all kinds of people. 
but by the simple, uh, by bringing the learning situation closer uh, to the situation in which we learn to speak in the first place, involving all of us. People would never learn to speak at all if uh, the, all the senses weren't richly involved. Big dogs and little dogs, black and white dogs. Hello, hello. Do you like my hat? No, I do not like your hat. Goodbye, goodbye. Since television is not so much an extension of the visual power as of the tactual and involving power, naturally, therefore, any form of language instruction which calls for much use of sight and sound and touch and taste altogether ideally favored by television. So uh, people who uh, continue to look at television as if it were a sort of inferior or low-grade movie are missing the complete uh, meaning and opportunity of television. When the technology is in introduced into a uh, natural or unprepared environment, it has a startlingly different effect, doesn't it, from uh, its intrusion into a highly technologized environment. The, uh, it's like introducing a motor car into a primitive tribe. The, the Indians, the North American Indians, were not impressed by motor cars. They were fascinated by bicycles because the bicycle seemed to them a tremendous achievement. It was against nature, the fact that you could balance aer aer aeronautically, as it were, on two wheels, whereas four wheels on the ground meant nothing to them. But the, uh, in terms of the um, extension of uh, classroom or other prepared conditions into a, an area where there are no classrooms and no teaching and so on, it's incredible uh, to uh, imagine the effect it might have. Um, it's like bypassing ages of technology, isn't it? It's like um, introducing a book into a pre-literate area or inter introducing classrooms uh, into areas where there had previously been no form of uh, uh, formal instruction at all. Minnade monoki o kaizou shite tsukutta televisi. Koko dewa kodomo tachi to nakayoshi no sensei ga tari mo san nin mo fuye to. Telebi no sensei da. Demo, dou na fuu ni shite tsukuru no desu yo? そうです。温室作るんです。ほら、こんなに大きな温室。中は風が入らないようにガラスでちゃんとしてありますから、とっても暖かなんです。これ何だと思いますか？これはキュウリです。夏食べるキュウリが今頃できるんです。Three poets. Today, the poetry of Irving Layton. I tell you, William, there isn't a ghost of a chance people will be changed by poems. Book club editors wish to believe otherwise. Commencement day orators and commissars. But we poets know the facts of the case. People will remain stupid and deceitful. Their hearts will pump malice and villainy into their bloodstream forever. All the noble lines of the poets did not make Hiroshima and Belson not to happen, nor will they keep back the coming holocausts. Why should you add to the mischief, the self-deception? Leave that to the culture peddlers. Be truthful. Tell children who their forebears were, the curse they bear. Do not weaken even a single one of them with fine sentiments. Now you can draw an objective or a non-objective picture today. Perhaps you'll prefer to just create an interesting arrangement of lines and colors which have movement and direction. Now, those of you who have the film strip online, get ready to view frame 23. This is a color photograph of the board construction or framework of a building. And here your eye movement is rapid. There is nothing restful about the way your eye is almost jerked from one angular line to another. Go on now to frame 24. This is a ceramic bowl designed by William Kagi of Sweden. It is a large bowl and a heavy one. 
Now here is one thing important in the design of all ceramics. They must seem to sit quietly and firmly on the table. Bowls that look as though they might fall or roll off the table give us an uncomfortable feeling. Thus, this beautiful bowl seems to sit very sturdily on the table. Go on now to frame 25. Now you've been looking at horizontal lines which move your eyes slowly around the inside edge of a bowl. Here are vertical lines which sweep your eyes up into the air. These are tall, graceful pine trees in a forest in Finland. The eye movement upward towards the tops of these trees is a dignified, slow movement. And it stops with the lacy pattern at the top of the trees. This is the first year we've used uh, strip films in combination with radio. But to date, the results have certainly been very gratifying. We find uh, a wide variety of uses and applications and feel that the, the future is uh, wide open and very promising. Radio has proved more productive in the stimulation of original expression than television because the imitative impulse seems to be so operative in television that we get back the same kinds of pictures that we show on television. The film strip provides a great deal of flexibility and it seems to me avoids this imitative practice because it provides the classroom teacher with a tool, an instrument that she can use for her own class in a way which is most suitable for the particular group. It's fascinating to see how the children responded in their artistic uh, activities to an audio situation. Their work became less pictorial, less merely a matter of copying, less a matter of uh, matching situation with situation then uh, search for abstract form, for the language of forms. Uh, to give uh, the visual form, the uh, non-visual involving appearance is, is, a, is a considerable artistic feat. These kids were beginning to uh, uh, understand that uh, by simply following auditory instructions for visual situations. The translation from one medium into another awakened their sensory life in a completely new way. I was quite surprised. Well, we've had here at Phillips Academy at Andover for a number of years a program whereby all students are expected to have an experience of what we used to call art, but we are tending now to call visual uh, perception. The idea being that so many people, so many citizens are uh, virtually illiterate as far as the eye is concerned, although they may be quite proficient, quite erudite in matters of communication by the accepted academic means. So that from the standpoint of education, we feel it's extremely important to train the perceptiveness through the eye of every citizen. Uh, specifically, uh, this is done not only in terms of drawing or work with uh, three dimensions, but also we find that the camera and the photographic medium apart from the camera is of considerable use because it um, provides a very quick way in which a, a student can uh, observe and through observing discover relationships which are not so easily come by in terms of drawing alone. I don't want to take up much time introducing this film. It's quite short, but even so, the time is more useful when we have seen it and can discuss it afterwards. Uh, the point is, however, that you've been working with photograms downstairs and have discovered that the photogram is not quite the same as working with the true camera. It's a different kind of reality. In the same way, what you're about to see by Norman McLaren, you can relate, if you wish, to the work that you've been doing in the studio drawing or the work that you've been doing down in the dark room with photography especially with regard to the photograms that you've been working with, as distinguished from the reality of the true camera. Let's look at the film and we can talk about it later.
Uh, for centuries, the only kind of uh, skill or grammar or literacy that was taught was that connected with the writing, uh, reading and writing itself. All the other uh, skills and technologies of the environment were accepted as merely environmental and taken for granted. Today, we have, uh, because these things have stepped up in many of their developments, in many of their manifestations, we have to understand the language and grammars of many media. And uh, this, it, it, it is ra rather fantastic, isn't it, when you think of the number of hours that people spend in front of film or television, for them to know nothing about the processes of making these, these things, or, or nothing about the means available for themselves to express themselves. So the grammars of media has become uh, the happy, uh, this, this area has become a, a new area of stress in education. the results of uh, those scratchings, they come out on the screen uh, like uh, Chinese, Japanese art forms. Uh, this um, is a tremendous discovery for the children, obviously, in the, in the potential of a form right in, in their own hands. Like seeing oneself in print, like uh, writing poems and seeing them published, somewhat the thrill that uh, the OK More children get in seeing themselves learning to read and write by actually publishing themselves as they go, uh, by typing. But uh, the McLaren world makes a tremendous break with ordinary film in this way that by painting directly onto the film, you make the audience, as it were, the screen instead of making the audience the camera eye. And so the child then, uh, by drawing directly onto film, has the sense of mastery over the whole, whole world. It's like uh, a composer uh, writing a melody. He makes a world. The composer making a melody doesn't try to make a world that corresponds to some other world. He just etches or makes with sound a world. McLaren, when he draws directly onto film, makes a world. He, he isn't photographing a situation which corresponds to some other situation. So this switch from matching to making is a drastic one in, the learn, in terms of the learning process. It, it, it switches altogether, again, from classified data, from mere uh, matching knowledge to a world of actual discovery and actual knowing of forms. I, I think that you couldn't find a, a larger uh, uh, switchover in the whole history of education. I think that um, developing new techniques for developing visual literacy, that is a sense of form and texture, uh, a sense of the concreteness of things experienced in a sensitive way, is one of the most essential parts of anyone's education, for which present very little has been done except at a few experimental centers. A film which can present familiar objects 
in entirely new ways can, by showing material in a perspective that we do not ordinarily see it. It helps free us from the provincialism of whatever perspective has, has become habitual with us. It isn't only a matter of being presented with uh, interesting perceptual effects, but it's also a matter of putting the learner in the position of creating new effects himself. And the special importance of photography is not only having professional photographers and artists working together to present new sensory experiences, but to have the learner use photographic equipment and keep a running record, as it were, of his own attempts to shape and form material in interesting, exciting new ways. Uh, the film uh, program at the Carpenter Center is uh, made up of uh, two equal parts. Uh, one is in animation, which is uh, where we're situated now, obviously. And uh, although this looks like a monstrously complex piece of equipment, it in fact uh, is very simple. Uh, once the uh, elements of its design are understood, what it permits really is the animation of uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. And we hope that in a way the, uh, the stand will coordinate the activities of the center by making it possible for people working in two dimensions or working in three dimensions to uh, put their objects into uh, motion. The other part is not an orthodox film school curriculum. It's an attempt really to introduce people to the idea of film as a way of seeing things around them. And uh, what we do is to work in eight millimeter in the uh, initial course and they're given specific assignments each week. They're given a different kind of an assignment, which is meant to introduce them to one facet of the power of film, let's say slow motion or animated uh, film. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, I want to show you is the work done by a student who is continuing his experiment from last term in a special project in the animation of clay. This is with a simple camera. The idea of him working with, with cinema is the same as, as uh, Mirko Bosseldello's ideas upstairs of them working with sculpture. It's to give them a new way of uh, seeing things. It's to give them an opening on uh, their environment which they didn't have before. The uh, possibility of there being uh, television executives or even television directors is probably not as good as of them becoming poets or bankers when they leave Harvard, actually. But I think that once having taken these kinds of courses where they are given a chance to, to see in a new way, that they will be more at least visual bankers than they were before. And if they're going to put up a bank building, maybe it's going to be a, a good-looking bank building instead of a, a bad-looking one. Presumably, people tend to know least about the things they're most uh, I imposed upon uh, by. Uh, the, uh, there seems to be a mechanism of... Uh, protective inhibition, so that people automatically seal off the areas where experience is maximal. They seem to know least about the areas that they are most involved in experientially. That is why perhaps this uh, world of the um, uh, carbon center is so uh, exciting to uh, a highly literate and highly uh, retinally and visually oriented population. It's giving them back their other senses through the, uh, uh, through the uh, certain use of the visual sense, uh, through a very tactual and uh, low resolution use of the visual, they suddenly peop uh, get people involved with their other senses in this world, and they begin to sense uh, what is called plastic form again. Uh, the, of course, it is a kind of primitivism. It is like a rediscovery of primitive values of the unsophisticated, the unprepared environment, the non-technological world. This kind of thing tends to go along with a great deal of sentimental uh, uh, overvaluation, perhaps, and a, a great deal of uh, romanticizing of the primitive. Uh, this uh, goes along with the kind of glorification of the primitive world of childhood, and so on, which is a natural reaction against a highly mechanized environment. Actually, I've always had an interest in showmanship. Movies just haven't come along as my latest interest. And before this, I uh, used to be interested in puppetry, making mostly uh, marionettes and making stages, etc., for them. Later on, I got interested in puppets without strings and started constructing little men. And in order to make them move, I put wire in them so that they'd hold their position. I could be able to animate them. 
you've got to get, uh, if your camera runs about 16 frames per second, you've got to do uh, 16 of these movements in order to uh, have the scene show one second on the screen. So it gets quite tedious after a while. We continue to talk about the mechanized culture of today. In fact, uh, we have moved out of the mechanized world into the electric world uh, without especially understanding the new dimensions of the electric world. It is one in of involvement in the sense that people no longer merely are spectators of processes. They are very much now involved in processes, and therefore children love to get involved in making their own films, making their own programs. This kind of involvement is very natural to people in an electric world because an electric world is one of circuits of integral uh, loopings and uh, feedback. Originally, I have been a home movie fan. Uh, last year, I taught great hi history for the first time. We were covering the War of 1812, the general 1800 period. And I knew that we had Fort York here in Toronto with all its facilities, the 3 p.m. gun firing salute, the ceremonies down there. And it came to me the possibility that we might possibly shoot a, a film based on the War of 1812 using Fort York for some of our props. And then in one class, I happened to be discussing this possibility with the students, some of whom are sitting over there. And they came up with the idea, why don't we shoot a film starring us? And we went from there, and this is how we got into the, the whole idea. Okay, Americans. Come on, Americans. All right, Valdis. Forward. Come on, a little faster. Now, Valdis, up. Faster, Jim. Let him have it. John. Larry. Ian. Dave. Okay, cut. Who got shot with the arrow? I did. Okay. Well, I actually played two roles since we didn't have a uh, cast of thousands like we'd like the impression to look. In the first part of the film, I was an American corporal, and coming on near the end, since we had quite a few scenes to shoot, I became a private, demoted. All right, let's rehearse it. You put it under his armpit right now. That's it. Good. And then, Ken, keep your arm oh, close no, to start I'll drop it. Okay. I'll drop the pipe. Drop the yeah, pipe. Just a couple of... Yeah. Sir? Yeah. I mean, better he ran in and stuck it in the wound. Jazz it in. No, we keep your arm in close to start with. Gonna start with. Start I'm going to start with. Like what? Okay, advance. Keep going. Stop! Arrow Valdez. No, 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 no. We were, uh, I like the scalping part and the gory part, but also the uh, most music thing that happened to me there is we had Poison Ivy. Me and my friend Larry Smith, we were the only two that had Poison Ivy since we were the Indians, and uh, we had problems with it all summer. Right? Right. I will go pow and you'll fall. Go different ways. Let's make it really grotesque. Like Don't smile, Myron. You're vicious. <laughs> yeah. Too much teeth. You look too kind, Myron. All right. <laughs> Let's go. Go on. Pow! That's a crumble oh, oh, superb. Nice. Very good. Don't smile. <laughs> you are the happiest looking corpse I have ever seen. <laughs> I think we had a, a marvelous day shooting it. I think they learned something. You can never be sure. But I think they did learn something about filmmaking. I think they learned a little bit about the capture of York. And I think it added a bit of excitement to the history class. And this was one purpose for my shooting it to add something exciting, something a little bit different, perhaps to try to compete with television in the history class. Well, the best way to learn the grammar of any form or the way in which it is laid out is to get involved in using it and making it. Obviously, children engaged in making a film turn to look at films with brand new eyes. Hmm? There it modulates a UHF transmitter. There it modulates a UHF transmitter. 
the child of the future is a rather terrifying thought. It makes even science fiction look rather tame. What is uh, in effect happening is a kind of extension not only uh, of the learning process, but of consciousness itself into the outer environment, so that the child of the future is likely to be able to program consciousness with the same ease with which we have previously programmed curricula. But uh, I, I, can't, uh, I can't be terrified by such uh, prospects, really, because uh, these are also extensions of man. Uh, they are not ways, uh, they are means of, of becoming more oneself rather than ways of becoming alienated from oneself. Now, you can't possibly imagine a technology except the most uh, specialist fragmentary type that could possibly alienate man from himself. They amplify our powers, they accelerate our powers, and they enrich uh, the learning process enormously. Received at Prince Albert after reflection. I think that's it. Scientific challenges and at the same time, so vital to the health of 